Welcome back to The Pursuit Zone, the podcast that interviews explorers that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. I'm your host, Paul Schmid, and this is episode 214 with Laura Scott, where we talk about her five-month-long cycling adventure along the Iron Curtain Trail while recovering from a spinal injury. Let's start the show, and let me introduce Laura. At the age of 22, she had a spinal injury that ended her dreams of becoming an athlete. Through a lot of pain, disappointment, and treatment, she slowly got better. Two years later, she wanted to prove to herself that she could still achieve big goals, so she set out to cycle the Iron Curtain Trail, also known as Eurovelo 13. The route took her from Norway on the Barents Sea through 19 countries ending on the Black Sea at the Turkish-Bulgarian border. It was five months and 5,600 miles of cycling a diverse range of landscapes, cultures, and climates. You can read more about her adventure at cyclingtheironcurtain.wordpress.com. Laura Scott, welcome to The Pursuit Zone. Hi, Paul. Thanks for having me. About your injury, before this happened, like what kind of athletics were you into? So slightly unusually for someone that turned out to do a lot of cycling, I was actually a hammer thrower. I was really into sports as a kid and uh, it's probably my, probably was and still is my favourite thing to do. Uh, but back in 2010, I got headhunted by um, a group called UK Athletics in, here in the UK who were looking for, at the time, shot putters and discus throwers for the, to train up for the 2016 Olympics. The idea with these sorts of talent IDs was that if you, for certain sports, if you have someone that's enough of a genetic anomaly, essentially, you'd be able to train them up and, and that they might be able to perform particularly well at, at that international level. For some reason, I got put forward, which was great, got headhunted for it and, and ended up getting selected. And I remember someone sitting me down afterwards and saying, well, love, you're not quite big enough to be a shot putter, but you've got very strong legs and we like your attitude. Would you like to try the hammer? So I um, yeah, moved to Loughborough, which was the, the home of UK Athletics and started hammer throwing. How long did you do that for? I was doing in it for a few years before I got injured. So, uh, yeah, it was a, a fairly major change in terms of direction. I sort of moved there to to train full time and really, really enjoyed it. Made the national championships in my first year, which was great. But I got uh, unfortunately got injured out before I amounted to anything that exciting. Uh, I mean, what happened with the injury? Is that something that you can talk about? Yeah, of course. So um, it's more a series of injuries in that. Um, I've got a series of herniated discs down my back and, and some degenerative disc disease. On, a, on an MRI, it's nothing, well, it, it looks, my back looks a bit battered, uh, but it looks like an athlete's back with a bad back. That's pretty much all. The issue came when um, I had access to some of the best physios and, and sports physicians, but um, it just didn't respond to treatment the way that they expected, unfortunately. Um, so I was sort of in and out of hospital probably at least twice a week for a year. I remember being sat down and, and told that it was, a, it was a hard no on sports from then on. Um, I fought back pretty hard. Um, they, uh, they said, you know, oh, you'll end up in a wheelchair. And I was like, oh, well, you know, wheelchair sports sound good. And um, they were like, you won't be able to have kids. And I was like, oh, lots of people can't have kids. You know, I'll adopt. And they were like, no, no, you're, you're not hearing this. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, that was really tough, actually. And then they, they kind of changed the treatment focus from recovery to get back into sports to trying to recover some sort of quality of life sort of increase my mobility and because uh, things had got particularly bad by then while the treatment was going on so yeah that that was what happened with my back so sometime i don't know how many years after it uh that you started to get the idea for this the cycle tour um how did that whole idea for the cycle tour come to mind it was about a year after they told me that i couldn't do sports again yeah, it probably came from a number of directions. So I'm naturally a really active person and I suppose everyone has a coping mechanism. For me, I was in a situation where I had an injury that had changed my career and changed the, my dreams and the direction I wanted to go, my life to go in. It had also meant that I was in quite a lot of physical pain and was having to adjust to some fairly substantial changes in what I could and couldn't do in, in normal day-to-day -day life. Uh, with some of the neurological complications that had developed. So I was desperate to find an outlet really for that. And I could cycle. It turned out one day I got on a bike and I found out that even if it wasn't particularly fast, 
and I sort of relied on my right leg a bit more than maybe most at, at some stages. Most cyclists will know that feeling where you've been cycling for too long and your hands go numb and your arms go numb. I just get that very quickly, but it's not the end of the world. And so the, that feeling of freedom was phenomenal, finding out that I could still do something that, that gave me a, bit of a, a little bit of adrenaline. The endurance cycling happened totally by accident. I remember a housemate of mine, um, I'd moved into a new shared accommodation and he'd just got back from a cycle tour. And I remember sitting and listening to him. He'd done it solo and I was asking, you know, w- weren't you scared and why did you do it? And he showed me some photos and I just thought, gosh, that seems incredible. I was at a period in my life where actually no one was very sure what would happen with my, my physical abilities and there was uncertainty about whether or not I'd be able to hold down a job because of the problems with my spine and the other parts of my body from the neurological complications. And I was just, I wasn't happy. And I went upstairs and I Googled European cycle routes. And the first one that came up was the one my friend had done. And I didn't really fancy copying him. And the second one that came up was um, this news that the EU was trying to put forward a, a new route called Eurovelo 13 along the frontier of the uh, the former Soviet Union down the Iron Curtain. And it just really appealed to me. And it, it, it was as quick as that. I just saw it and thought, yeah, that, that's something I'd like to try. And I, I guess that when you think about having a, a back injury or some kind of spine injury, and then you think also about cycling, you think, how can that be good for the spine? You're, you're going to be bouncing up and down on the seat. That can't be good. Uh, the, the, the vibrations moving up into your back. I'm just wondering, did you consult with a doctor at all to get kind of the A-OK? Like, yeah, this you'll be fine. I'll be honest, I probably should have done, but I didn't. The The last time I'd seen a doctor before I went, they told me that I'd be in pain for the rest of my life and that I wouldn't be able to ever sleep without drugs to take the edge off it. And and honestly, this was, it was probably irresponsible in, in many ways. It's probably not something I should recommend. But for me, it was a reaction against that and really finding something that I could still do. Uh, you know, some of my training partners had gone off to the Commonwealth, you know, the year before and some of them were going off and, and did exceptionally well at the Olympics that the following year. And this, I mean, it's not, nothing like the same scale as being the best in the world at anything. Certainly, I would never claim, never claim to have been as talented as that. But it was nice to find an outlet. And so the things that I did do, I mean, at this stage, I'd done a, a vast amount of physiotherapy, like I say, so sort of twice a week in hospital for a couple of years at this stage. I, I knew quite a lot about what was going on. I also got my bike adjusted. So I had springs put in my saddle to reduce the amount of vibrations going up through my spine. I had the largest wheel size available, which is uh, one of the ways of reducing uh, reducing vibrations as well. I had figure of eight handlebars fitted to give me as many back positions as possible. And honestly, yeah, sometimes it wasn't great for my back. And there were times where I'd have to take a rest day or two because I wasn't physically able to keep going. But everyone's bodies have, have limits and pushing your body is always going to be a challenge. And this was, uh, I think, probably in terms of what it did for my mental health and my ability to know the, the new limits of my, my body. I think it was incredibly valuable. And I suspect that the amount of movement that I have now, and, and it's much better than it used to be, I'm, uh, I'm a lot more mobile. I suspect that some of that is because I was able to, I was lucky that I was able to keep active, but I, I think it's also helped in my case. I suppose, yeah, now that you say that, that you were probably sick and tired of doctors by that point and just said, the heck with it, I'm just going to do this thing. And uh, by the way, let me just mention that I became aware of you through this this micro lectures thing that you did with the Royal Geographical Society. I, somehow I'm on their newsletter. Or I, I don't remember exactly how I, I learned about this particular micro lecture. Just to add my own curiosities, how did you get involved with the micro lecture? I heard about it through a colleague of mine at the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry. So this is a, a group that I volunteer with here in the UK. And I hadn't spoken about my bike ride once. I, I once spoke about it at work and it's been, ooh, gosh, five and a half years. It's not, not something I've been particularly public with. But when everything went into lockdown, they needed activities to fill their training calendar. And so someone suggested, oh, get Laura to talk about that bike ride she did. And then it turned out that one of my co-members of the First Aid Nursing Yeomanry, or the, or the Fannies as they're known for short, which always causes great amusement, one of my fellow Fannies was a member of the uh, RGS and so I said, oh, you must apply for this. And so I did. And uh, yeah, I, I got selected to, to talk on their micro lectures event. If I remember right from that, you said you had a, a surly disc trucker. 
Yes. And you explained a little bit about how you had that set up. What I'm really curious about is how did you decide to go with the roll off hub? Because you, you had a roll off hub on the back. And I'm like, did the guys at the bike shop just do a really good sales job of, of upselling you to this? Or how did you make that decision? Based on a couple of factors. The first is that I am not a mechanic and I particularly dislike uh, fiddling with bike gear. I can do all of my maintenance. I can align them, everything else. But that was very much a treat to myself. And the, the second was that um, sometimes I, I struggle with my hands a little bit because of my injury. And I just thought, actually, yeah, that, that was one way that I made my life a little bit easier. And I love it. I was really, really glad that I had it in terms of the range that it has. Um, it was perfect for this with, with me because it has some very, very easy settings on it. And when you're and my bike weighed 45 kilos which isn't too bad when you're going on the straight and they're already up to speed. But when you're going uphill, you really feel that. And so having some of those easier gears was, uh, was a huge help. You learned about the, this new Eurovelo 13. Once that point uh, in time came, like how much time did you spend planning or how much time went by to uh, get yourself ready to go? I had five and a half months to get ready. So I found out about it in the January of 2015. By the beginning of June, I was off. I'd uh, got to the end of my time at work and had set off. So during that time, I did loads of research and on uh, on the different equipment that I would need, did some cycle training, that kind of thing. Yeah, I was also very aware that there was a lot that I would have to learn en route. Let's talk a little bit about, I guess, first of all, the budget. So you had a little bit of time to save some money up. And what were you thinking in terms of, because most of the budget's going to be chewed up by accommodation if you were to stay, say, in mm-hmm. hostels every night. So what were you think? what was kind of your plan? Was your plan to camp and then mostly, I mean, in terms of like an average daily budget, did you have a number that you created for yourself? So I did take a tent with me and I particularly, other than the last month when it was particularly mountainous and I sent my tent home because I just wanted to, to get to the finish line uh, before Christmas at that stage. Uh, up until that point, I, I did mostly camp, uh, which as you say, kept the budget much lower. So I was fairly generous with myself in terms of budget. So there were times when, you know, if I passed something really interesting, you know, it was unlikely I'd go to that area again. I had no problem sort of paying for entry to interesting things that I passed. And I also did sometimes check myself into into sort of hostels and B&Bs, particularly if I was struggling with my back. Particularly when I was camping, my daily budget was roughly 20 euros a day. It's a, it can be a really cheap way of traveling if, uh, if you do rely quite heavily on your tent. And uh, particularly for the first sort of thousand miles or so, um, it was incredibly rural. And so I'd just stock up whenever I passed the supermarket and spend the evening in my tent with my little stove cooking and well, obviously cooking outside of my tent. Yeah, I, I could get by really cheaply. I know that there are people that do really impressive sort of very, very low budget trips. And uh, I wasn't as, uh, as phenomenally frugal as those sorts of people. There were, there were times for my... Um, I checked myself into a hotel for my 25th birthday as a, as a treat to myself that had a spa. And I also did the same. I, I checked myself into a hotel for my final night uh, when I was on the Black Sea. And I, I literally wheeled my bike up to reception covered from head to toe in bike oil and bruises and cuts and scratches and soaking wet. And this very polite man at this very posh hotel went, excuse me, madam, but what happened to you? <laughs> Oh man. Yeah. I, I think I lean more towards your style than those ultra, the ultra, uh, cheap ones. I made sure that I had budget to get myself out of trouble because I was aware that there are a number of reasons why this might go wrong for me. You know, I wasn't an experienced cycle tourer and I might've had problems with my back on route that might've required me to, to get myself home. So I think maybe in, in the future, I, I could maybe give it a go doing one of those super budget ones, but for, for a first time, particularly a first time solo, I, I felt like this was a nice approach for me. You get yourself up to the starting point. Um, how, how do you get there? Three flights, yeah, to get to, to Kirkenes and then up, which was sort of the nearest point that, we could, I, that I could get to. And then um, I was really lucky. Uh, I then got driven by a, a cycle touring enthusiast to the, to the actual start point uh, in a place called Grenz Jakobslev, which is uh, right on Barents Sea on the border between the very north tip of Norway and Russia. So it took a while to get there. We mentioned the roll-off hub. You Unfortunately, your bike, your wheel got damaged in the process. Mm. So that was a whole nother thing of you having to deal with trying to figure out how to get that fixed, which delayed your start. But I guess what I'd like to ask you about is 
when you're up there in that part of Norway and the Barents Sea, I mean, what, what's it like up there? What, what do you see? So I was there in almost exactly in midsummer. It's a landscape that changes enormously. Um, if I'd been there pretty much any other time of year, there would have been a really substantial amount of snow, uh, obviously, particularly over winter. When I was there, there were patches of snow. But the great benefit of being there at, in the middle of summer was that I got to see the midnight sun. So you have this incredible, quite stark landscape with these huge hills and fjords. So lots and lots of uh, of rock and water. And yeah, the sun was just up the entire time. It was uh, actually really challenging to sleep. Um, but other than that, it was very beautiful. So if I was in my tent, obviously, they're, they're not really designed to block out light because you don't tend to need to. So I'd have to... I'd have to wrap my buff around my eyes. Otherwise, it was it was absolutely impossible to drop off. How long did that, the wheel issue that you had, uh, how long did that delay you? It delayed me my two weeks. Uh, so I was sort of just up 300 miles north of the Arctic Circle, chilling out for, for two weeks. It was lovely. Uh, but yeah, an unexpected way to start uh, an adventure with not being able to go anywhere. Your blog mentions that you were using a guidebook. So I wanted to ask you, like, what was this guidebook? And the second part of that would then would be how were you navigating? I used the, the Bike Line guidebook series. So there were three guidebooks for the length of my trip. Even so, even with three of them, I'd, I'd, I'd have one with me. And then when I got to the end of it, I'd uh, or got close to the end of it, I'd just tear out the last few pages and post it back to my, my parents' house and they'd send out the next one. Even with the route broken down into three different guidebooks, the maps were on a scale of one to 400,000, which is uh, one centimetre to four kilometres, which gives you quite a lot of scope for going wrong um, if you're not entirely sure on a turn, and particularly if you're up in, say, Lapland. The settlements are far enough apart. You'll only find out if you took the right turn at a particular fork in sort of two or three days' time when you eventually do or don't reach the town that you were planning on arriving at. To help supplement that, therefore, I use an app called Maps.me that enables you to download very, very high quality detailed maps. And so I would use those as well. But I, I deliberately didn't use any sort of GPS route tracker or anything like that. It, it was quite important to me that I, I felt like I was sort of working my way through. I really like maps. So it was quite a nice part of the process for me. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I've seen that people that do that, they the, their phones mounted on their handlebars and they have the, the GPX a file in there so they see their route and if they it almost makes it seem like you're in some kind of video game i would think i think it makes you focus a little bit more on what's around you i'm sure we've all done that if you're maybe driving somewhere with the sat nav on and you've done the route a hundred times but then if you're ever asked to do it without the sat nav you realize that you've not really looked around properly it does change the dynamic slightly you're right after a, a delay your bike is ready to go it's a few days through norway and then most of the time it now is going to be spent through finland Tell me about what it was like cycling through Finland. I loved it. It was the part of the trip that I was most nervous about when I was setting off. I thought that if something was to go wrong and I was a really, really, really long way away from anywhere, that, that I'd feel really challenged. And actually, it was so freeing. The landscape is immense. It's just forests and forests and lakes and hills and quite a lot of mosquitoes if you're there at midsummer. That, was, that bit was, I was less of a fan of that bit. They were so thick that if you wanted to eat, you'd have to bring your hand between your mouth and your and your food just before you took the bite to move them out of the way. That was grim. But besides the mosquitoes, it was it was just the most wonderful landscape. And I think for me, it was the perfect place to have that sense of freedom and to really find my feet. Yeah, it, it was probably the place that I look back on most fondly because it was where I felt very happy, very free. And I realized that actually I could do what I'd set out to do. At this stage, what type of roads or road surfaces are you riding on? So in Finland, they weren't too bad. Uh, the vast majority up there was was tarmac. There were some sections of sort of dirt tracks and whatnot, but the majority up there was tarmac. Not always the best quality in particular in particular remote areas, obviously because the of the impact of like freeze thaw when there would have been snow. But that was probably some of the easiest cycling in terms of the uh, the surface. When you need to make a turn. Is there a signpost there that says Eurovelo 13 this way? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, no, not at all. Um, this was re really quite early days for the route. I think the only countries I saw any signs in were Estonia, Germany, and Serbia, I think. So three countries out of 19. So yeah, this, this is not a uh, 
it's not a particular it wasn't at the time I, I don't know since but it certainly wasn't a particularly well trod route and uh no i didn't see many road signs at all what i got a sense of when i was reading through your blog was that this was kind of a family affair for you you were joined at times by your parents and your brothers and an aunt and uncle H- how was that experience for you being able to cycle this with your family it was really lovely yeah i was incredibly lucky to be so well supported my brother and my youngest brother henry came out and uh, i think he cycled about a thousand miles with me in the end he, he did amazingly uh, my dad did uh, did a really substantial portion as well and yeah my aunt and uncle later on and my my other brother felix my mum drove him and my dad the whole way across europe to meet me so that they could uh, drive and cycle along with me for part of it uh, he'd only himself just got back literally one one day before he was put in the van uh, from Nepal, so he must have been exhausted. It was amazing to feel so supported. I think when you have a really serious, when you have a really life-changing moment, um, I'm assuming they'd have been concerned. It wasn't something that it was particularly easy to talk about, and I think they must have struggled to see the amount of physical pain that I was in in particular. And this is a really special way of them being able to show support and love um, in a situation that was it was very difficult to speak about. You get a chance to cycle into St. Petersburg, Russia. What was yeah. it like going into there? Was that your first time in Russia? Yeah, that was my first time in Russia. I was a bit nervous the whole way down the, the Finnish Russian border for, for visa reason. I'd stayed on the Finnish side because it, you've got like a limited window for your Russian visa. And so the whole way down that border, I'd had people saying, oh, you know, you'll definitely get killed in Russia. You'll definitely get attacked by the, the mafia. My friend got attacked by the mafia. It was, uh, people seem to like to tell me stories about how bad it would be. So I went in pretty cautiously. I'll admit I didn't camp in Russia. I, I stayed in, uh, I stayed in hostels. I, maybe it was just me being nervous. I'm, I'm sure it would be perfectly fine. I'm sure there are loads of people that would have camped there successfully, but I felt a little bit more comfortable relaxing, if not. And uh, that, that was during the section that my brother Henry was with me. And so I was probably slightly more protective as well. I, I didn't like the idea of being responsible for anything going wrong with him. The roads were manic, absolutely manic going into St. Petersburg. We were driving in on, on truck roads, uh, cycling in on truck roads. And, you know, you'd hear a, a beep behind you and there'd be a lorry coming towards you. And the, the beep was bail off your bike now um, because they weren't about to overtake. They were just going to keep going. So you make quite slow progress that way. Uh, it was quite nerve wracking. And we were also going into literally the worst headwind I'd, I'd ever seen in my life. So the, the day that we went into St. Petersburg was uh, it was 100 miles. So it was a long day for me. That was the furthest that I cycled in any one day into a headwind, having to constantly fall off your bike to avoid being literally run off the road. Uh, we were very glad to make it there to, to put into context, maybe a little bit of the effort required between the two of us. We ate an entire jar of peanut butter. So that's 2000 calories of effort, not including the jam and the bread that it went on for peanut butter and jam sandwiches. And that wasn't for any of our meals. We had four meals that day and we managed to eat on top of that 2000 calories worth of peanut butter in peanut butter and jam sandwiches. So we were doing quite well. It was actually so tricky getting into St. Petersburg that on the way out, we opted to cycle on the motorway because at least it would have a hard shoulder. I did quite a lot of research and I'd seen that other people had had similar problems. And uh, and so, yeah, opted to at least go a route out that, that had the motorway. It, I was aware that it, it was frowned on, but that other cyclists had been able to do it and had, and had found it slightly safer. Unfortunately, it, it worked well up until the point, uh, but I actually took the wrong turning. I'd learned some Russian for this part of the trip, but I'd misread one of the road signs. that They've obviously got a different alphabet and uh, ended up going the wrong way. And I thought, oh, well, this is unfortunate. There's not really a way of getting off this this part of the motorway. We'll just wait until we get to the next junction, we can turn around and go back. I then found out that the next junction was 100 kilometers away. Russia is a really big place. Uh, so rather than accidentally doing a 200 kilometer round trip just to undo this, this one error, we wound up having to wait until there was no traffic coming, run our bikes to the central reservation, haul all of our bags over the bikes, jump over, put them back on the bikes and, uh, and get to the other side of the motorway to, to cycle out that way. So yeah, um, St. Petersburg was quite quite an experience, but beautiful as a city. You mentioned food, so let's just take a, a slight uh, detour into that topic. What kind of food were you eating mostly on a, on a day-to-day basis? As much as I could get my hands on, to be honest. It's one of the great joys about cycle touring. It's a wonderful way to, to explore a continent in this case, because it's 
you've got a constant change of scenery you are getting some exercise you can see things it's a nice speed and you get to eat your way across a continent it would vary based on what was available sometimes there were supermarkets available sometimes there were places where i could go to hotels sometimes i was eating at people's houses i am a, quite an adventurous eater so I ate anything going. I ate a dried reindeer heart that someone very kindly gave me. I ate loads of, uh, I mean, the things you'd imagine, sort of lots of bread and lots of carbohydrates and potatoes. But any local food that I could get my hands on, I was uh, really excited to try. And by and large, it went quite well for me. Uh, there was one day in particular when I was in the, in the mountains in Germany and it was a Sunday. And up until then, I'd actually always been able to get hold of food on Sundays. I'd, I'd started off quite cautiously carrying um, a lot of emergency supplies and, and sort of um, military issued ration packs and that kind of thing. And actually, I hadn't had a problem until that stage. So to keep my bike weight down, I'd, I'd sort of worked my supplies down. And then this one day, I genuinely couldn't get hold of any food. There were It was just a, a part of the country where all of the food shops in this very rural area closed on a Sunday, which was understandable. And the only food that I had was um, maybe a, a pot of jam about five centimetres across in diameter and about two centimetres worth of jam in the bottom of it. And so I, I squirted my water in from my water bottle and shook it up and uh, I had a teaspoon of diluted jam every half hour. And that was my food for getting me through the, the day of mountainous cycling. But generally, I ate much better than that. I'd love to do one of these this type of a route someday. I think for me, I mean, five and a half months or was it five months? Yeah, about five months. I think that would be a little bit too much for me. I don't, I don't, I might run into some visa problems, but like I was thinking if I had to do it, maybe a good place to start would be in Estonia. If you had to shorten your time, like what section do you think you would start from or what section would you cut out? Oh goodness, that's so difficult. I think Estonia is a, is a, great place to start because if you were to begin there you'd get through lots of different countries as you then particularly get that really really interesting historical section where you're sort of dotting either side of the uh of this former sort of east and west divide down down europe but as you might have gathered from my answer before i adored finland i really did and so i'd be so so from a personal perspective I'd, I'd be really reluctant to cut that bit out i think that was probably my favorite country so from a, an advice perspective, yeah, Estonia sounds like a great place to start, but I don't think I could cut out the beginning section of my route. Yeah, you, it might be something that you just have to do in um, over multiple years. It did, do I remember right from your presentation, you, or maybe your blog, was it, did you run into a couple, were they from Germany or something that had done, had taken multiple years to finish the route? Yeah, I did. So um, they'd spent yeah, one summer doing the, the southern part and sort of around the Balkans. They spent one part doing Germany and the, the Baltic states, so up to Estonia. And then the final year when I passed them, yeah, they were doing Russia and Finland and Norway. So yeah, it's entirely possible to do it that way. At some point here on your journey, you had some items stolen, which is a bummer. Any thoughts on, on uh, safety around, you know, petty theft and what maybe you could have done different to prevent that? It was actually stolen when I was with my family. And I suspect that when they were visiting, probably my, my wariness was lower. I was probably less cautious. Actually, people, people asked loads, you know, did, did you feel unsafe as a, as a woman traveling by yourself? And I was certainly very nervous some of the time. But most of that was unfounded. Most of that was sort of fear of the unknown. And I, I did take quite a lot of care of my belongings. So I had... Um, I had a very good lock for my bike and a big waterproof casing over it. At night, I kept all of the rest of my belongings inside, um, inside my tent with me. And I had reasonably limited luggage as well, so it's probably easier to keep an eye on everything. Once you've uh, lived out of a couple of bags for that length of time, you can spot fairly easily if, if anything's missing. Yes, yeah, so I was probably more security aware than I, than I needed. Well, no, I was probably the right amount of security aware because when I was by myself, I was lucky and, and, and nothing went wrong. But, you know, there, there was one evening, uh, I think I told the story at the, uh, at the RGS lecture, where I woke up in the night and heard someone rustling with my plastic covering that covered my bike. And the idea that someone could have stolen my bike was just dreadful. You know, it was, it was giving me all of this freedom and I didn't want someone to take it. And I yelled bloody murder. They probably didn't speak any, uh, any English, but they, they'd have got the gist. Uh, from the way that I was yelling and I, I opened my tent and I poked my head out and I 
sort of saw this figure fleeing into the darkness. I felt like I'd really done my bit, prevented someone from stealing my bike from me. And it was only the next morning that I realised that actually they'd been tucking a pack of sweets into my bike wheel as a surprise for me in the morning. So I'd say more more often than uh, more often than problems with security and and safety, I I encountered kindness, um, a really surprising and and uplifting amount. Yeah, I guess it's just the old adage: just don't let your things out of sight because they could disappear. Absolutely, and yeah, it's it's the moment your guard is down. When uh when I was around my family and we were we were literally staying in a tourist campsite, and it all felt very familiar and and very lovely, and and that was the moment that something got stolen. So, yeah, maybe don't let your guard down. But if you never let your guard down at all, you'd be very hard hearted. I think there's maybe a there's maybe a balance somewhere between the two. At some point in the journey, you were beginning to think a little bit about time and thinking, oh, you know what? I, I really need to make it home by Christmas. And if I don't make some changes in my route or how fast I'm going, I'm not going to make it. So there's a decision where you, I think part of this is to go on the the Danube River path. Um, can you kind of explain like what, how did that, or I guess I got a couple of questions around it. One is like, how far does that take you off route of the Eurovella 13? What was the purpose of detouring on that path? The Danube part of the trip didn't actually, that wasn't, the decision wasn't made to shorten the time. Um, it was made for, for two reasons, really. The first was that it would enable me to see a couple of capital cities I really wanted to see. So it didn't take me very far off my route at all. What it meant in practice was that I joined just before Austria. This is the place where the um, where the Eurovelo 13 and the Danube route overlap. And you go on through Austria to uh, Bratislava. And then from there, the, the route diverges slightly. And so I had the option about whether or not I would like to cut through the middle of Hungary and go into Budapest and the middle of Serbia and go to Belgrade, or if I'd rather go around the border of Hungary and the border of Serbia. And I thought that actually... I just wanted to see something slightly different. I wanted to see both of those cities. I'm very goal orientated and, and, you know, achieving this goal was really important to me, but I was also really careful going into this, that there would be bits that, that popped up that maybe I would need to revise what I was doing. And this was one of those times. The other advantage of going on the Danube is that it is much flatter because it's a river. And at, at this stage I was struggling quite a bit physically and it gave me a little bit of extra time to recover. So it meant that I got to tick off a couple of things from my bucket list and also it, it helped me physically. Yeah. Speaking of the, the physical part of it, I guess, I mean, do you, are you, do you find yourself able to cycle every day or do you find yourself having to take a day off here and there? Yeah, I, I definitely had to take time off. I think anyone doing long distance endurance cycling, particularly if they haven't done much of it before, does need to take rest days. It's a really important part of any physical activity. Um, I probably had to take more than most. And that was okay. So maybe an, a normal pattern for me, particularly at the beginning when I was getting used to it, is I'd do maybe 80 kilometers one day, 80 kilometers the next day, and then maybe do a reduced day on the third day. So maybe 50 kilometers and have a half day. And then maybe repeat through that and then have a rest day. That was how sort of the cookie cutter pattern that I would try and use for my weeks to give them some structure. So one rest day and two half days a week. There were times where I didn't go with that pattern because I was maybe in a really interesting city that I wanted to look around in a bit more detail. Um, but there were also times where I literally just couldn't. So most of the time I could cycle with both legs. Some of the time I could cycle with my right leg and occasionally I'd sort of just strap my left leg on and go quite slowly, but I was still going and that worked out okay. But there were times where, as you say, the vibrations from my back were, were just becoming problematic and so yeah I would maybe camp and um, if I couldn't walk if, if the problems were significant enough for that then I'd maybe just lie in my tent or lie and look at the scenery and, and read for a day or maybe two and then keep going I think um, I'm very lucky that I can do as much as I as I do with my back but it does require me to be more flexible and I think that this trip for me was a good exercise in that that actually I can still dream big and I can still achieve and I can still do exciting things outdoors just as long as I listen to my body and yeah that was a really positive learning process for me. Which part of the route did you find to be the most challenging? I think probably some of the mountains in Germany 
were very challenging. It was also a lovely place to cycle. I mean, the, the signposting was great. There are loads of cyclists around there. It was, it was probably the place I was in most company while I was cycling. Particularly in central Germany, there were a huge number of hills and mountains. And as I mentioned, it's it exhausting on that size of a, on that heavier bike. You know, there would be evenings where I'd see a road sign for the, the town that I was planning on, on reaching. And I'd, I'd noticed that actually there was a little ski lift sign beside it. And actually most people in winter would be reaching that town by ski lift. Yeah, it certainly slowed me down a lot. And it obviously puts your body under a bit of extra strain. And, and if, if I let that get out of control, then, then it would cause me problems and I'd have to take extra rest days. You mentioned that Finland was one of your favorites, but when you think about back to some of your other favorite sections of the trail, what would those be? I loved going into Budapest down the Danube. That was stunning. It was also absolutely beautiful um, down in Romania as well. Really, really enjoyed that section. It was probably quite a challenging section. It was um, I was moving in the opposite direction to the European migrant crisis at the time. So it was certainly from a social and political perspective it was really troubling to see what was going on and I, I was very aware of how privileged I was that I was able to move so freely between these countries that other people were risking everything to cross those same borders in the opposite direction it was also stunning yeah and I, I mean each stage has a has a special place in my heart maybe for different reasons going along um Estonia and, and, and along the Baltic it's lovely to be by the sea and I have my family with me yeah, there's, there's lots of special parts for me to that trip. What do you see when you go through a country like Romania? Let me be more specific. A while ago, I read a magazine article about bears and how Romania kind of has a problem with bears. So every time I think about cycling through Romania, I'm like, oh man, what happened if you come across a clump of one of these, like all these bears? Did you see any kind of uh, any wildlife or anything like that when you go through Romania? didn't see any bears but I saw a lot of wild dogs and also um, wild boars I remember a couple of occasions coming on uh, coming across wild boars with piglets um, which you certainly need to be careful of I, I got out of there very quickly and yeah large large numbers of, uh, of wild dogs I actually ended up um, attaching a whistle to the zip on my fleece that I was cycling in um, so that at least I'd have something to blow and make noise and in my head I was sort of fighting back and and scaring them off, it probably didn't help at all, but it gave me something to do while I was being chased. Did you have any opportunities to use warm showers? And if you did, I'm wondering what your experience was like. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> really wonderful. Anytime I had an option to take a shower, I would. I would. And even, I mean, there were some spots that there were saunas, certain parts of Europe that have quite a lot of saunas. Oh, it was incredible. Unfortunately, even if there was no warm water available, I would still have to shower every night. Um, otherwise, um, as, I'm, as I'm sure a lot of cyclists are aware, you just need to, to keep everything clean and dry. I mean, I didn't have many pairs of shorts. I had two pairs of shorts with me. So my outfit from the day would come into the shower with me and get cleaned and then would have to dry overnight. And if it wasn't dry before it went in my bag to cycle the next day, I'd sort of drape it over the handlebars for a bit and, and let it dry out there. So, yeah, showers were really important. Otherwise, I'd have... Um, it certainly wouldn't have done me any good. <laughs> yeah, but you're speaking in general about taking showers. What I was asking about is if you're, are you aware of the organization? It's not an organization, but it's kind of like couch surfing for cycle tourists. It's called Warm Showers. Oh, no. I, honestly, I've not heard of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, like I said, it's like couch surfing and I've never used it, but apparently I think now there's an app. And there's just people around the world that will host cycle tourists. You just contact them kind of like, uh, you know, through the app and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be here around this time. Can I, you know, stay at your place? And the idea is they, you can either pitch your tent in their yard or stay on their sofa and, and hopefully you'll get to take a shower. Oh, that sounds amazing. Y you know what? I think had I known about it before, before I went, I might not have had the courage to do it. I think there might have been a part of me that was like, gosh, that would be very much sort of contacting a stranger in advance and then making myself vulnerable, sort of going to their house. And and that was something that I had loads and loads of people that were so kind in inviting me to my, their house while I was out there. And it was something that I gradually became much more comfortable with. But it was a real challenge at first. 
feeling comfortable with that and, and people were so kind in helping me to feel comfortable to go and, and to stay with them and, and to share at their homes so I think um well I'm, I'm sure I'll do more uh, more cycle tours in my life so I'll definitely uh definitely look up warm showers in the future that'd be really useful yeah no I know what you mean it's um when you're not aware of something like a warm showers it's like you you're more spontaneous or I, I think the the uh the situations yeah. that you come into you have more spontaneity yeah absolutely and and maybe there's a balance for both there may be moments where you want to know exactly where you're going to be and that you're going to have a, a a roof over your head or a, or a warm shower at the end and then there are other moments where actually if you planned to the nth degree you'd miss out on so much you need to be able to to have a little bit of flexibility I wanted to ask you, um, because you were a relatively newcomer to the idea of cycle touring when you started this, what ended up, do you think, at the end being your biggest misperception about going on a cycle tour? I think the idea that somehow it might not be for someone like me, that actually you, you had to be a certain type of person, you had to have a certain type of physical ability, and actually you can make it your own. You know, as I said, I I certainly wasn't the fastest cycle tourist ever, ever to cross Europe. And, you know, some people do it on a shoestring and some people probably stay in hotels the whole way. And, and you can really, you can make it your own. You can go off book and, and do it in a way that you want. I really wasn't sure going into this if I could do it. I thought I've maybe had like a, a one in three chance of getting to the end. I thought, you know, maybe there's a one in three chance that I'm not logistically capable and, and maybe a one in three chance that I'm not physically capable. I think that was my biggest misperception that actually this is something that if people are interested in, there's all sorts of ways of doing it. And it, it is a real joy if it's something that, that really calls to you. So your surly disc trucker with the roll off hub, how did it hold up over the trip? It was brilliant. A couple of bits and pieces obviously needed, uh, needed replacing. I got through a couple of sets of tires. I got through a lot of sets of disc brakes. My panniers needed uh, needed patching occasionally and, and needed some new screws. But the bike itself, other than the broken wheel on the way out, survived amazingly. The rider more or less survived, which was nice. Um, and incredibly, no one ever believes this, I genuinely didn't get a single puncture, which was incredible. I had um, marathon tyres on. And while I wore through the full set of tyres a couple of times, I never actually got a punctured in a tube. So you used the the same tubes the entire trip? When I changed the tires on those two occasions, I put new in the tubes in just in case they were getting a bit worn as well. Wow, that's great. I mean, who can ask for anything more? Oh, I had images of being permanently stuck at the side of the road in the rain, in the dark, in a place that, you know, feeling very lost, changing tires and I, you know, that that's part of it if, if that's what ends up happening to you. But I, I got off really lightly on that front. When you got to the end, uh, was it a, I'm assuming that you, you went looking for a bike box to ship your bike back home. Was that a, a difficult experience? It was amazingly easy for me. I was so lucky that um, I just called ahead and found a bike shop on the, the town that I hit on the, uh, on the Black Sea and explained the situation. And I said, you know, when I flew out, I was able to, to pack up in a particular way because I had access to different tools. And I just said, you know, do you mind giving me access to your tools just so that I can break down the bike and just lending me because bike shops um, have loads of old bike boxes from uh, when whenever they get new ones delivered. I just after they'd let me use one of their bike boxes and actually they were so kind. They broke the whole bike down for me and packed it up. They just said, you know, we'd like to do this for you. They were lovely. If you were going to do something like this again, knowing what you know now to go off on your next cycle tour, what would you change? I think if I was to do it again, I'd want to do it with someone else. This particular trip, I'm really proud of doing by myself. And it was really important as it was, I think, quite a personal journey for me in terms of working out what I could and couldn't do. And it would have been really frustrating if someone else was with me for large parts of it, because there were some days where I'd do, you know, 100 miles. There were some days where I could only do sort of five, I think was probably the shortest day I did because I, I just physically couldn't. I think the next big challenge for me would be accepting that next step of vulnerability and saying, actually, I'm confident enough in my ability that I'm willing to bet that I could probably keep up with someone. And that actually to accept that humility that if I was really struggling physically and if I was really hurting, that I could maybe still be gracious and just tell someone else that that would be a real challenge for me. And I think that would probably be 
the right next step to take. What was your biggest takeaway from the adventure? Happiness. Um, the fact that I could still do something that I was proud of and that I could still express myself as a as a profoundly physical and, and outdoorsy person. To find that, to find a way to do that. And, you know, the the tips and tricks that I needed to do to kind of nurse my body through that, that was life changing for me. Yeah, that was my biggest takeaway. Well, just looking at my notes here, uh, I see the cashmere thing I was going to ask you about. So what yeah. was the deal? You, you at some point in time were uh, wandering around in cashmere? Yeah, I was. I don't know if you have this, this concept in the States, but um, in the UK, it's quite common to take a gap year between school and university. And I had looked up some of the options available and you can sort of pay quite a lot of money to do an organized trip. And I felt like that maybe wasn't for me. And so I started looking a little bit more widely. And we have uh, a family friend who is now in his 90s, but had spent about 30 years of his career uh, working out in Kashmir. And so he put me in touch with some people and I managed to get a spot um, just sort of supporting in a school out there. It was brilliant. I really enjoyed it. I spent a lot of my time doing outdoor pursuit stuff. So um, up until about a year or so before I'd gone, there had been quite an active group who would protest quite strongly against young girls doing outdoors activities and and particularly sports. And there were quite a lot of um, acid attacks. And the school that I was at was really keen that they would come back from that and start to involve more girls in sport. And so it was brilliant for someone like me. I was, you know, hiking up in the Himalayas and um, there was a huge run that we did. There was an enormous lake swim across the Dal Lake, um, the cross and the recross. I was allowed to participate for that one. Um, so accounts vary on exactly how far it was between uh, 11 kilometers and 15 kilometers. But it was a long swim either way. And there were 200 students that did it, seven of which were girls, which is fantastic. And yeah, it was uh, it was an incredible place. It's a it's a, it a troubled place in in some ways as well. Um, I probably spent about a quarter of the time that I was there locked inside the compound. With um, there were men with guns on every entrance and very very high walls with barbed wires. And if there were if there was unrest in the street, then you couldn't go out. And you just accept that that's the the way that things work in that place. And you learn to play by the rules. So yeah, I um. Yeah, got to spend six months out there. Laura, where will your interests take you next? Oh, everywhere. I have a little bit of a pipe dream that I would love to cross every continent under my own steam. Uh, so I've done Europe, north to south. I've got my eye on South America. There's a, a route that you can do down the Andes. You start on the equator and you end up at the very south tip of Patagonia. That's the one that's really caught my heart. And so i um, I've started learning Spanish just in case, you know. In the meantime, I've got, um, obviously that would take quite a, quite a long time. I think it's about 11,000 kilometers. So until I can get that time in my life, you know, if there's time between work, I've got a couple of other bits and pieces. Um, I did my first half Ironman a couple of years ago. I can, uh, since the, the cycle tour, a, a year or so later, I, I got to the stage where I could jog again and got really excited that I could do competitive things. And so last summer was meant to be my first full Ironman. Uh, it got cancelled because of COVID, but I'm hoping to do one this summer instead. It won't be fast. It probably won't be very pretty, but that will keep me, keep things ticking over on the endurance front for a little bit longer. And yeah, just dreaming up the next big one. The thing through uh, the Andes, you would do that by bike? There is a route that you can do by bike. And I've, I've done a little bit of research and there are a few people that have done it. I'm just starting to have a look at it. I think I'd probably, I've not been to South America at all before, and I think I'd like to maybe go and, and check out whether or not the roads would be suitable for cycling, particularly on a loaded bike. If not, maybe it'd be a, a hiking adventure, something else, but I'm in the, in the scoping process. Well, Laura, how can people learn more about your adventure or, or contact you or find you online? So you can find out more about my adventure on my blog, Cycling the Iron Curtain. And if you'd like to get in touch with me directly, you'd be more than welcome to, to email me. My email address is laura.scott, S-C-O-T-T, -T, 9090 at hotmail.co.uk. Yeah, I'd love to hear from other people that are keen to, keen to do their own cycling adventures or to, to join up, for, join up or um, 
if they'd like to if you'd like to tell me about um trips that you've been on yourself i'd be really keen to hear more okay laura scott thank you so much for coming on the podcast uh, i really appreciate it and uh best of luck to you on all your your future adventures thank you very much Thank you again for listening. This episode was recorded on March 19th, 2021. If you want to write to me, you can do so. My email address is paul at thepursuitzone.com. You can also leave me a voice message by either recording a message with your phone and emailing it to me or by using SpeakPipe. You can do so by going to speakpipe.com slash thepursuitzone. The best way, as I always say, to support the podcast is to help spread the word and let others know about it. Be sure to follow The Pursuit Zone anywhere you get your podcast content. For more information about this episode and others, head on over to thepursuitzone.com. (laughs) 